Hello everybody, buenas tardes, welcome to Paris, and today we have a beautiful piece for the record here, a 200-year-old psyche, as this is called in French, after Psyche, the goddess of the soul in ancient mythology. And now for those of you who are new to the channel, I really hope that these videos will help you to better understand the decorative arts, perhaps if you're a beginner, to really grasp the difference between them, these original art quality pieces that typically predate the year 1840, and, you know, everything else that we generally ambiguously qualify as an antique. And of course, for those of you who know far more than I, please know that I am flattered by your presence and very encouraged by your interest. So, without further ado, this is a benchmark example of a psyche, of a standing mirror, a chevel mirror, I suppose it's also called. And I would like for this name to tie into the Platonic idea of beauty as a window into the transcendent, you know, as these old, beautiful items tend to give our skeptical, ordinary minds this sensation that perhaps there is some meaning in this world of ours that is beyond the reach of our normal scientific inquiries. That's the wonderful rush of a great piece. And that quality is also perhaps why we feel such distress when old and beautiful items are in peril, or perhaps, God forbid, damaged, because maybe they reflect a part of us which is itself beautiful and beyond time. So anyway, I would have loved for the name Psyche to be some sort of wink at a deep level of metaphysical consciousness back in the day, but thanks to the mysterious administrator of Mublitz.com, I now know that this name was likely a selling point that flattered the egos of the original buyers, a glass à la Psyche, or a mirror fit for the goddess of the soul. But anyway, I digress. The point here is that I call this a benchmark piece because we see that all of its qualities have been kind of pushed to the limits of what we could expect for this type of piece at this fine domestic tier of quality. There's another tier of fine furniture from the past that's referred to more as official or public furniture because, well, it was for official purposes within a government to express the magnificence and the stability of the state. This, however, is a fine domestic piece, meaning it was a luxury item intended to beautify the domestic surroundings of someone who was no doubt uh, not representative of the entire population in terms of their wealth, but whatever, it's domestic. And these domestic pieces retain an intimacy that the more famous works of decorative art, which you know, might have adorned the bedroom of some king, simply do not have because they were public pieces to begin with. Um, they were more art and appearance than they ever were furniture. This is a wonderful blend of the two. That's why I find it particularly moving. Anyway, the size is exceptional, certainly with regard to width and height at six foot six. There's a real completeness to the decor here that we could appreciate on all of the surfaces of the piece. We might imagine how much less impressive the piece would be if these beautiful surfaces here, the three tiers of them, had been left blank as opposed to adorned with different marquetry on each surface, including a wonderful fan motif, a sort of sunburst fan that deploys here from the front. And then one of the things that really denotes quality for me, not only the sides being finished as well, if we take a look at them, which is almost expected for such a piece, but something that I found surprising was the inlaid fillet within this scroll. Now, of course, there's an inlaid fillet on the exterior of these little legs, but it's really something to see that they went to the painstaking trouble to install an inlaid fillet that is barely visible inside the scroll itself. That really communicates to you the depth of quality that, well, you were buying at the time with a piece like this, that wherever you look, it's going to surprise you in terms of the quality of execution. That's something that's going to totally change after the onset of the industrial era, let's say, give or take 10 years after this was made. I guess at this point I better continue on this diatribe about why this piece is a fine benchmark example. The next step to that would be glancing at the back of the piece, which really surprised me in that it is so finished. Of course, it's simpler than the front, it's not a mirror, but it is just wonderfully paneled in an unexpected way, which is, nevertheless, totally to the tune of the quality of this whole object. We're also going to notice that the back of the piece is inlaid a little bit as well. However, there is not a fan motif that we glanced at earlier on the back. And perhaps that just helps us differentiate which is really the back, 
when we put this piece together. But also, the back won't be as decorated because perhaps it would be up against a wall, but the back on this piece is of a quality such that if this were in a grand room and you had it placed where occasionally one would walk behind it, it's still quite impressive from behind. Now, of course, we've covered the subject of Charles X furniture before, as it is one of my favorite styles. And in terms of furniture history, it is one of the most accomplished, one of the most abouti, as we would say in French, which just means that it's been kind of pushed to the limits. It's, it's hard to go any further, at least in terms of the quality of execution here. And that makes sense because, well, the late 1820s here are situated at the end of a centuries-long timeline, chronology, of ever evolving and improving tools and techniques in the art of furniture making. And so it's natural that even if you don't like the style, it's natural that there's a certain quality of execution here that is unparalleled in the previous styles. Now, all Charles X furniture that we have looked at is romantic from the Romantic period, meaning that through their unusual beauty and quality, they sort of ask us to dream about an impossibly beautiful past that, of course, you know, never could have happened, uh, but normally they do that in a neoclassical way, conjuring up visions of ancient Rome, the bygone republics, and we'll see that in their decor, which is often of neoclassical palmettes or scrolling acanthus motifs, you know, the repertoire of, of, of ancient classical art. Now, what makes this piece particularly interesting within the rare Charles X style is that it is a rare facet of this style, meaning that instead of being neoclassical, it is in fact neo-Gothic, therefore anti-classical, as the Gothic style is an organic one that is derived from nature, not derived from, that, from classicism. So that is in, an interesting paradox within the same style. But it happens to be one of the rarest and, in my opinion, one of the most endearing and beautiful styles in French furniture history, the Charles X neo-Gothic, with these tall pillars here that remind us of the pillars that stretch to the ceiling of a cathedral with the light coming through the window. Those are, those are the trees in the forests and the light coming through the sun. And so this style is, is evoking some sort of wonderful vision of the Gothic forest. We even see some acorns here that evoke that. Acorns which are reflected by further acorns here in the marquetry around the glass as we are in the Gothic forest with this piece. Something J.R. Tolkien, something J.K. Rowling about this item. Oh, what a rare micro facet of already very rare period decorative art for us to take a look at here today. Couldn't be more delicious. Gracias for coming. <laughs> and so with all that being said, everybody, I thank you for watching the video. And if you would like to support this endeavor of creating an online video library of the most compelling pieces that I encounter, please subscribe to the channel. It would be most appreciated. Thank you.